Good afternoon, everybody, and you're very, very welcome to Glen Cree's um, Section 42 for You event. And this event is being brought to you by the two programs in Glen Cree, by the Intercultural and Refugee Program, and also by the Women's Leadership Program. So um, we're part of the Dublin, the South Dublin County Council Social Inclusion Festival this week. And the theme is staying connected. And I think it's the most uh, relevant theme I've heard for a long time because we've all become very disconnected and we're doing everything we can, um, both personally uh, in, in a human relations way and also digitally and in terms of technology uh, to, to reconnect uh, with those who we want to reconnect with and with other people who may not know the, of our work. Uh, so I have to commend um, the, the, the work that my colleagues Sinead, Holly and Amina have done to uh, publicize this event and to make links with all of you who are here today and you're very, very welcome. So uh, we have some great speakers and we also hope that we haven't scheduled too many um, uh, prepared inputs so that we can really have a good discussion here today uh, about Section 42, what is it anyway, uh, where did it come from, what's it supposed to do, what does it actually do, and um, you know why should people be concerned about it. And we have people here today who really are living Section 42 in, in their work and in their lives. And uh, we're very, very fortunate to have uh, Assistant Professor Bashir Otukoya from DCU um, with a legal background who uh, can hopefully uh, give us a good start uh, to, to, the, to, the, to Section 42 and to facilitate uh, the event today. And Bashir is also a member of the Independent Anti-Racism uh, Committee, which was established in the new Department of Equality, Disability, uh, Integration and Youth and Children. And um, so he is very well placed uh, to help us all today uh, to discuss this really important topic and to bring it down to earth, I suppose. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Bashir. Thank you so much, Nadette, uh, for your generous uh, words. Um, you're all very welcome here this afternoon, uh, where we are looking to discuss Section 42 and you. Um, Section 42 is a uh, public duty that's imposed um, upon all public services. There are about 17% um, of the Irish population that comprises of ethnic minorities here in Ireland. And basically, um, to fully serve the public, all policy and all policy makers, um, public servants and any service providers, they need to have due regard to equality, diversity, interculturalism, human rights. And so as we progress to a more um, diverse island, um, interculturalism needs to be embedded in all legal and policy development. And so to this end, section 42 plays a key role. So all public bodies in Ireland have responsibility to promote equality, to prevent discrimination, to protect human rights, of not just their employees, but also their customers, the service users, and everyone who's affected by their policies and plans. It's a legal obligation, what we call the public sector equality and human rights duty. And it, you can find that in section 42 of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Act of 2014. Now, I'm a law lecturer, and every time I'm teaching my students, like, oh, an act, 2014, you know, there's all these acts, how do I know which ones apply? Um, well, what I always say to them is that well, all laws apply. <laughs> and so in the first place, it's about knowing where to find them. And I suppose uh, as a lecturer, it would be remiss of you not to tell you where to find them. You can find uh, the Irish Human Rights and Equality Act on the irishstatutebook.ie, if you type that into uh, the Google, irishstatutebook.ie, it'll bring up the act and go to section 42, have a look at what it says, because it does prescribe some duties on public service providers and, uh, and the public bodies in general. And thankfully we have the Irish 
Human Rights uh, Equality Commission, who published uh, uh, a framework for public um, service providers to implement this duty into their framework. And it's very simple. It's to assess, address, and report. And I suppose before I hand over to um, Selena, who will uh, start us off in this conversation about Section 42, I think it's important to note that um, the public sector duty is not just a duty for the public sector, but it is a duty placed on all of us um, as human beings. <laughs> because these are human rights provisions, we need to recognize that as human beings, we also have this duty to ensure that our employers, our public providers, um, that they are assessing the needs of their, their uh, employees, their uh, service users, that they assess the human rights obligations that might impact their relevant services. And then to address those problems, I think that's probably the most important, is to address those concerns. And then to report uh, uh, um, uh, uh, based on data uh, evident, uh, and evidence um, on the success of the uh, implementation or the outcome. What was the outcome? of the solution to the issue. And so it's you know, three simple steps that uh, public servants can utilize in their um, policies to ensure that they promote the um, Section 42 uh, human rights duty. Enough from me, uh, we'll come back to me um, after the speakers and we'll can engage in a conversation about what equality means and how uh, public servants can uh, utilize the section uh, and how we can benefit from Section 42. So I'm going to move on to the uh, next speaker, um, which is Selena, uh, and I might get, allow Selena to introduce herself for the benefit of some of us who haven't yet met her, if that's okay. Over to you, Selena. Okay, thank you, Bashir. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, my name is Selena Bonney, and I am South Dublin County Council's Disability Liaison Access and Equality Officer. And really, in a nutshell, what that means is my work involves assisting the council to meet its responsibilities under disability, equality, and human rights legislation. As, as Bashir mentioned, all legislation is relevant in, in, in certain ways, but we, like my job would be particularly in relation to disability, equality, and human rights. And to support the provision of accessible, inclusive facilities and services across the organization. I hold a master's degree in disability studies from the University of Leeds and a professional diploma in human rights and equality from the IPA and the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. But as a lived experience of, of these issues, I'm also a disabled woman. I'm a mother, I'm of mixed ethnicity. I'm a very proud Indian Irish uh, person. And I'm also you know, kind of a full-time worker. So when it comes to all these different things. I have a deep understanding of how essential it is to approach equality and human rights in an intersectional way. And what I mean by intersectionality, and you'll hear this word being used a lot these days, it's a much better phrase in, in the past, we talked about multiple oppression. And I am so happy we've moved on from that to look at intersectionality because as human beings, we're not one dimensional. There are many different sides that come together to make up the whole of a person. So when we look at addressing different issues, whether it's accessibility or accommodation or you know, services, we have to make them in such a way that we recognize that people are more than one thing. You know, so um, intersectionality is such an important way that we should approach everything we do to recognize and value the whole being. So as we, we're here to talk about section 42, Section 42 of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission Act, as, as Bashir said, requires public bodies to have regard to the need to promote equality of opportunity, prohibit discrimination, and protect human rights for staff, service users, citizens, and all policy beneficiaries across the public sector function areas. And in these three simple steps of assess, address, and report. And so there are, there are identified grounds. We have 10 now. So that's gender, which includes gender identity, civil status, family status, which will include carers and lone parents, sexual orientation, religion, age, disability, race, membership of the traveler community, and a new ground, socioeconomic status. 
So, you know, any one person can be, uh, many of those grounds can uh, um, apply to one person and that's where intersectionality uh, comes into play. With regard to South Dublin County Council and the public sector equality and human rights duty assists us to gain a clear understanding of the relationship between our functions and services and how to underpin them with clear measurable human rights and equality objectives. Equality, inclusion and accessibility are not new concepts to the council. Our core function is to provide essential services and infrastructure to the diverse communities that we serve. But at the end of the day, we are there to serve you. However, assessing our services and functions through a human rights lens has the potential to support and build sustainable communities where all the people of the county feel valued, welcome and included. Council already has a vast array of structures and policies and plans in place to support the inclusion of and deliver services to people in the county that experience marginalization, such as Irish travelers, women, disabled people, non-Irish nationals, and, and so on. And I just want to give you some examples of some of the ways that we are we're actually doing that in the work that, that we do. <coughs> Excuse me. And, sorry. Okay. Um, for example, in relation to structures and staff. We have an Equality and Human Rights Implementation Working Group that is comprised of senior staff from a number of different um, uh, departments across the council. There, we work with the Local Traveller Accommodation Consultative Committee. There's the Public Participation Network. Um, the council has a social inclusion unit and this initiative, the social inclusion uh, festival would be initiative, an initiative of that unit. Um, we also have, like my, this is my function, in relation to disability and access and equality. And there's actually, we've supported people within the county to develop a county LGBT plus network. But also then within the council, there's a staff network for our LGBT plus staff. So we're supporting people in that way as well. We've got the Coral and Oak um, to support young people's participation, the Migrant Integration Forum, and there's also a, a, a disability and consult to the panel where disabled people can feed into how their county is accessible to them. In relation to policies and, and strategies, you know, we've got traveler accommodation program, we've got county development plan, county integration strategy, a lot of different um, documents there that guide how we do what we do and give us tar targets to, to work towards. And then just briefly actions, for example, social inclusion festival, there is National Accessibility Week, the Bialtina Festival to um, support people of older age. And uh, we have an ongoing commitment to being a literacy friendly local authority. And that doesn't just benefit people with literacy difficulties, but it also makes our information clearer and more accessible to people whose first language may not be English. So I think that's really, really important um, when we're talking about inter interculturalism. We are now a jam card friendly local authority, which means that our staff are trained to know that if somebody shows them what, a little card that says, you know, jam, it means that this person needs a little bit of extra time and patience when they're dealing with council staff and council staff understand how to support them in that way. And of course, we recognize important days of international importance. So for example, tomorrow we will raise the transgender pride flag in recognition of Tra International Transgender Day of Remembrance, which is Saturday. And we raise certain flags at certain times of the year to draw attention to and create awareness of these very important diverse issues. And then in relation to staff, we would have various different family-friendly initiatives. So there's, it's quite a wide range. That's what I'm saying, it's not new to us, but, um, and of course we're all guided by the core values of our county uh, corporate plan. And these would be customer service, inclusiveness, equality, and accessibility. So uh, that's kind of at the top, and that feeds down into how we work and what we do uh, throughout the council. The Equality and Human Rights Framework commitment in our corporate plan recognised the need to, to eliminate discrimination and promote equality of opportunity and protect human rights. And we're currently working on developing our value statement and implementation plan at the moment that's being guided 
by our working group. And that will provide a framework where we can test everything we do against these equality and human rights standards to, to ensure that we are on the right track uh, with, with what we're, we're working with. Our public sector duty implementation plan will present an assessment of human rights and equality issue, issues to be considered in carrying out the council's functions and services and will state how these issues are or will be addressed. And we're gonna to continue to work on the framework because it's not a case of we make the framework and then that's the job done. We have to constantly test it and assess it and, and report on how we're doing. And we will do that in a very structured way within our annual report each, each year. And um, really, I, I didn't want to say too much because I'd rather listen to you and answer questions and discuss these, these issues. But I would like to thank you for the opportunity to update you on what South Dublin County Council is doing and what our, how strong our commitment is to it working towards implementing human rights, well, the public sector duty within the county. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. Uh, that was brilliant. Um, and gathering from everything you said to us today, um, you know, uh, other county councils could really benefit from your insights and your input into implementing this public sector duty. And, you know, I commend you for your work. Um, and thank you very much for, you know, sharing that with us. And hopefully uh, you'll be able to um, stay on and um, address some questions that we might have at the end. We really appreciate you, Selena, for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Um, I want to move on, if that's okay, um, to uh, our second speaker. Uh, which is Omolala Adeshina. Uh, she's originally from Nigeria, like myself. We share uh, similar passions for equity and equal access to justice, equality, inclusion, um, which is what led her uh, to earn a, a, a Bachelor of Civil Law uh, with politics uh, from UCD Sutherland School of Law. She is an advocate of uh, education for ethnic minority groups. Uh, on the power of political part uh, participation as a means to access and enjoy full citizenship. She's also been a member of RISE, People Before Profit, since 2020, a member of RISE Women's Caucus, and volunteers with Roots in Africa Island. Lola, it's a pleasure to have you with us today, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Bashir, for having me uh, for the introduction. And thank you all to, and to all of you for, for letting me and speak today. Um, there's a saying that I've come across a few times. And essentially, it goes like this, that if equality is the end goal, equity is the way to get there. Both equality and equity, as we know, promote fairness, the difference between the two is that while equality tries to achieve this through or by treating everyone the same, regardless of their need, what equity does is that it achieves the same or tries to achieve the same result, but by treating people differently, depending on what they need. So basically what equity does is that it prioritizes gaps that engage human rights and equality, while equality just prescribes the same treatment to everyone, regardless of, of, of the gaps. And in my view, this cannot be fair or just. Um, what um, Section 42 tries to do, I know it's really noble, um, I have gone through the act, um, it prescribes um, the duty of public bodies towards the, the people that they serve or towards the um, consumers, basically. The only thing that um, I noticed is that it doesn't go far enough, right? It doesn't say what the repercussions are for public bodies when they fail in their duties to uh, sorry, when, sorry, my internet connection is unstable. I don't know. Can you hear me? Hello? You're perfect. Yeah. All so right, then. Yeah, because Sinead suggested that I might need to go off the video in case, you know, just in case I go off, just so you know why. Thank you. Um, so basically, equal, when we focus more on equality rather than equity, marginalized people such as myself are not really being heard 
And it might be harder for us, right, to achieve, you know, to benefit from these um, legislations that talk about equality and, you know, that prioritize, you know, our human rights. Because marginalized and underserved people are already coming from a place of disadvantage. Um, equity would recognize this. Equality does not. Equality assumes that we're all starting from the same place. For the purposes of this um, legislation and for the purposes of the fact that we are in Ireland, to me, equality in this um, regard assumes that we are all, you know, white and privileged. And um, I'm not saying that all white people are privileged because I know that not all white people are privileged. I'm just saying that um, they being a black person, right? And um, coming into a majorly white space, this, um, when we focus more on equality, we're not um, taking into consideration the fact that we are coming into a society where our skin color is inherently viewed as, you know, bad. It makes us, you know, it, it doesn't account for the biases from the majority of the population that we are going into. And so the problem with all of this is that where, where, where the issue really lies now is that when you talk about human rights and how, and, the, and you know, I think Selena was mentioning intersectionality. It applies to, you know, like she said, everyone, because we, we all mix, we're all mixed, a different mix, like we're mixed with this and that. Um, for instance, in my case, being black, if you, I'm, a, I'm female, if you add that to maybe um, somebody who was black female had a disability and maybe their sexual orientation is not, you know, within what society prescri prescribes to be the norm, then they, it's even made worse. For instance, like um, an example that, that I like to use is like the, the case of maternal death rates for women from immigrant backgrounds, black and brown women, the maternal death rate is as, almost as high as 39%. And only, um, only uh, we account for only 24% of the user of the service. And the problem, I think where that comes from is that the kind of treatment that we receive sometimes, the kind of attitude that L, the health service has towards us, is linked to the reason why the mortality rate is high. When, if I'm a black woman who's pregnant, I am worried going into the hospital that somebody is just going to ignore me because um, history has shown us, has told us several times that black people's pain is not prioritized as much as white, people, white people's pain is. The black woman's pain Black women are viewed as being able to tolerate, tolerate pain more than, for instance, maybe a white person. I mean, this is absolutely not true, you know? And so this, um, this, this, uh, these issues here are some of the things that we really need to look into before we even like going to trying to say, oh, um, we're talking about equality or, or uh, and other things like that. And another thing is like, for instance, like recently the, the, in the news, there's this um, kids, the Glen, Glen Mayer School, I, I don't know if I'm saying that right, in Cork, where the, the kids um, were forced to start protesting because and they were protesting against discrimination. And in that case, the discrimination wasn't only coming from their classmates. It was also, they also said the teachers when listening to them and they got punished rather than you know call their classmates to and call and rather than like you know try to get to the root of the problem they actually punished the black students and then suspended some of them and some of them actually have uh, dropped out of school because they couldn't face the bullying so my question is the school has a duty to protect these kids our kids and if the public body, you know, fails in its um, fiduciary duty to protect the kids, Section 42 does not really say how 
to address this issue because there, there are consequences. It, an act is just an act, except, you know, it, it, it's, to, it's also stipulated in the act what the redress is going to be, what are the consequences, because this is a mandatory um, act. The, I mean, the, the rules, the duty is mandatory. However, um, research has shown that public, public bodies don't treat it as such. It's a legal obligation, but they don't think it is because um, section 42 does not say what the repercussions are. It doesn't give us an idea of maybe whether or not they can be subject to judicial review if they fail in their duties towards us, um, marginalized people in general. It doesn't really say anything about that. And to make it worse, the courts don't want to get involved because you know the old idea or the old doctrine of um, separation of powers. I mean, it's kind of like, in my opinion, a bit convenient because it's, um, it's assumed that once the conversation goes into race and discrimination, um, everybody wants to osh, osh, and like, oh, no, 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 don't say that. We are not racist. Um, but for, no, we're not like that. We are, you know, you can't say that. That's not what it is. Um, you know, so unfortunately, the courts um, don't want to get involved because they'll be like, oh, we are stepping on the toes of the legislative harm of government, right? And this is, I mean, this is um, something that happens all the time. We've seen that happen with the with um, social econo economic rights. We've seen that happen with housing rights where the courts are like, they don't want to get involved. And what this does is that it gives the government too much leeway in picking and choosing what they want to do, like depending on the agenda of the government of the day, it gives them too much power. So in my opinion, one of the, uh, what I feel is that, what I think is that it's really all depends, like you, 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 the, the burden is really on the shoulder of the commission to make sure that the, uh, the legislative arm of government follows through in terms of, you know, making sure that the legislation contains um, ways in which the perpetrators and public bodies who are supposed to protect basically who have this legal obligation, but sometimes don't go far enough. They need to be able to have legislation to deal with that. What is it going to be? Who's going, uh, what's going to happen? Do we have a case in court? Are we going to get redress? Um, so um, basically that's why, you know, um, roots in Africa Island, for instance, with this, uh, we, we are, the reason why we're here is so that we can be like a voice basically to, to be able to express what some of our people are saying, right? And what happens is that it would be very good if um, public bodies, for instance, can talk to organizations such as us and others out there, if, you know, for maybe for sensitivity training, to understand what the language is that you could use and things like that. Um, anyways, um, I think I'll stop there now, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, so if anybody else wants to say something else, like maybe I could say more things later, I don't want to take too much time. Um, so, so good, thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for um, those accounts, uh, uh, um, some of the problems with um, Section Forty Two is that you know the sentiment is great, but you know where's the teeth? There's no to, uh, teeth to it. So how do we ensure that um, you know we uh, we ensure accountability for non-implementation of this duty? I think that was the key message that I got from that, and also on the issues. Uh, um, that are facing ethnic minorities, especially when we talk about that intersectionality that Selena mentioned earlier on, on black women and the use of um, uh, health services. Um, you know, that's a, a, a huge problem. I suppose that, um, what I can say to kind of address some of those issues that, you know, there is a national um, anti-racism committee, and this is something that I personally have uh, ensured that it, you know, is covered in the National Action Plan Against Racism. So you know, I'm delighted that you're able to bring that point up again. And then you also talk about equity and, and the difference between equality and equity. And I, I find that fascinating. Like, and you know, we, share, you know, we share the same uh, understanding in that regard. And I, I like to uh, explain equity and equality to my students and the importance of uh, that principle. And I always tell them the story of the scientists 
who has a cage. I'll, I'll be quick, so we can move on to the next speaker. There's a cage in a room, uh, uh, there's a ladder, and there's a banana on top of the ladder. Uh, um, and a, uh, a uh, scientist introduces a monkey to the room. So the monkey instinctively wants to get the banana that's up the ladder, but he tries to climb up and he gets a shock. So he falls down, he tries again, gets a second shock, so he knows, okay, I can't go up this ladder, no banana for me. But he knows if he waits a while, this uh, scientist will come in and give him a banana. So you've, you know, uh, reward and punishment. That's kind of how, you know, um, <laughs> the system works, society works, right? So a second monkey comes in. So the first monkey wants to know, well, is it me or is it actually the ladder? So he lets the second monkey goes up. The second monkey gets shock, but this time the first monkey also gets shock, shock. And so um, the first monkey tells the second monkey, please don't go up, we're gonna get shocked here. If you just wait, you will get a banana. He doesn't listen, goes up, gets shocked. So what does the second person do? Beats him up, say, hey, I told you not to go up. So from now on, anybody, <laughs> any new monkeys that come in, we're gonna beat them up before they go up to the, uh, <laughs> go up to try and get the banana. <laughs> so anyways, the, the moral of the story is that I, I, I actually started the story um, the wrong way around. Um, so originally I would have started with uh, their cage in the room monkey comes in, tries to come up the ladder, there's already a few monkeys in the room, and they beat him up, and they don't explain to the new monkeys why they're going up this ladder, why they're getting beat up. Mm -hmm. And I think the essence of that is that, you know, a new, um, you know, we're all born into this society. Uh, some of us uh, um, share ancestry here, some of us don't. And the moral of that story is that we're all born into society. Some of us don't even know why the rules operate the way they do, and we just comply, and we don't question. Things. We don't question why does it work this way and how could it work better? And I think Lola's, you know, it really explained the, the importance of equity uh, and not to understand equ equality works, as she explains, in a homogeneous society when everyone thinks the same and everyone has the same values and principles. But Europe, or indeed Ireland, is no longer like that. And we need to uh, achieve the same results that we would have result under equality. But looking at people differently, recognizing that color exists, that variation exists, that differences exist, and not to treat those differences as a, you know, a problem on society, but rather to, look, uh, to see the benefits and to see how we can achieve that equality, but through uh, equitable means. So I, I, I really love that, Lola. So thank you. Um, thank I digress. So let me move on to our next speaker, if that's OK. Um, Amina is, the, uh, is our next speaker. She's the program manager of the Glen Cree Women's Leadership Program uh, that supports and empowers women all across the island of Ireland uh, who've been affected by political conflict. She holds, a, um, she holds a BA, a Bachelor of Arts in Neuroscience from Trinity College Dublin. And she's currently completing a PhD in Sociology of Sports, exploring Muslims' women experience of sport. Passionate about sport, clearly, human rights and gender equality. She sits on the board of Sports Against Racism in Ireland, Sari for short. She is experienced in using sport as a non-formal learning tool to tackle numerous social issues such as racism and discrimination. She was the uh, project um, coordinator of the, sorry, just give, bear with me two seconds, get a message pop up. Sorry, she was the project coordinator of the hijabs and hat tricks program, encouraging young Muslim women to play football after FIFA lifted the ban on the hijabs. And she's taught sport, culture, and society for two years at Nottingham Trent University. And she's worked with sports organizations in Ireland and abroad, such as FIFA Foundation, Special Olympics, Michael Johnson's performance, Sport Against Racism Ireland, and Champions Factory. So we re really have a true champion of addressing racism and uh, discrimination using sports as a tool. Amina, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Bashir, for that introduction um, and to Nadette and Sinead for inviting me to speak um, at this event. I think based off that introduction, you can uh, get a sense of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce how sport can be used as a tool to address social issues such as racism and discrimination, but also to promote social inclusion and celebrate cultural diversity. Um, a lot of what I will talk about, whether you're interested in sport or not, can be applied to various different settings. So they're practical 
um, things that we can implement into our work, um, whether it be our professional um, lives or personal lives to make um, what we do more, more inclusive. Um, and where I'm going to start is um, by telling you a story about how I got involved in this work in the first place. So my introduction um, sort of hinted at what I was initially doing. I was studying neuroscience in Trinity College Dublin. Um, but while I was in university, I um, was really passionate about sport. And I joined a sports organization called Sport Against Racism Ireland. Um, I previously experienced um, racism and discrimination, particularly anti-Muslim racism um, in the education system. I have a mixed background, so I'm Irish um, and Egyptian. Uh, come from a Muslim um, family. So there's a lot of intersectionality there, as Selena mentioned, um, and a lot of complexity that comes with various um, or dual ident my dual identity. Um, so I was really interested in addressing racism and discrimination and was quite active um, or would have described myself as an activist when it comes to issues around human rights um, and gender equality. But it was when I joined this organization in university called Sport, um, the organization's called Sport Against Racism Ireland, where I learned that sport could be used as a tool to address these social issues. Um, a lot of the time when you first go into a room and bring up a social issue right off the bat, sometimes depending on the group that you're speaking to, they just automatically tune, tune out and they don't want to talk about that, um, that issue. But using the medium of sport, a lot of the time, um, People don't think about sport being political, even though it, it can be used as a political tool or can be used as a way of um, teaching people about uh, particularly difficult um, topics. Um, but it was sort of like a light bulb moment. Um, and I really felt like I understood what Nelson Mandela said when he said sport can be used to change the world when I joined this um, sports organization. So Sport Against Racism Ireland is a sports organization that uses sport to um, address social issues and promote social um, inclusion. The main activities are based in Dublin and I joined the organization back in 2014. Um, so to give a bit of context, that year, March 2014, FIFA had lifted the ban on the wearing of a headscarf um, or head covering um, while playing football. So that affected not just Muslim women playing football, um, but those that wore the, the kippah, uh, anybody that was wearing a turban. That ban was lifted, which meant that now Muslim women could compete professionally in, in football. Um, so what Sport Against Racism Ireland did at the time was set up a programme specifically addressing um, or specifically trying to promote Muslim women to participate in football. Um, at the time, there was Muslim girls um, in, in Dublin that were interested in sport um, and had previously experienced uh, exclusion from sport because of their, their hijab. Um, and one particular woman was uh, Fadila Haji and she was the, the inspiration for this particular program. Um, her brother was involved in, in uh, the, the organization and he had noticed that his sister was constantly excluded from football and being a, or growing up in a family of all boys, she was really passionate about um, football, but hadn't a team where she felt uh, accepted and included. So he designed this program, um, her brother, Abdul Haji, with his um, friend that also was involved in uh, the organization um, to try get a group of Muslim women together um, and teach them football. But uh, for me, this this program, it's called Hijabs and Hattricks. It was very much um, different to any ordinary football club. It wasn't um, like a, a club where you go to training, you play football and you go home. It was very much, um, very much focused on bonding and providing a inclusive um, and welcoming space. And this was particularly important for the program because these women were coming in having had experiences of racism and discrimination. And in order to encourage them to get involved in, in sport um, and, uh, and create an environment that was inclusive, it needed to address issues um, or barriers that were put up in the, 
in, in sport in other environments. Um, so uh, Sport Against Racism Ireland, what it did was to consider or to implement cultural and religious considerations. Um, so what, what, did, what did that look like? Um, it, it meant, um, or th I'll give you some examples of how uh, this, this program implemented certain actions that made the team more inclusive. Um, so as I said, we didn't just go to training um, and go home. We would do bonding exercises right from the very start, from day one, um, we would go to training and after the training session, they would organize different activities where we could get to know each other more and where we would feel like, um, create a sense of belonging. So for example, uh, we would have a trip as a group to Croke Park. Um, we would go in the evening after our training session uh, to dinner together. Um, we had identity workshops that was facilitated by uh, a youth worker where we talked about who we were or who, um, how we feel people perceived us but who we wanted to be um, or how we wanted to be perceived by other people um, and all of these extra activities that were implemented into the program um, provided a space where people could talk about issues that had affected them either in the past or continue to um, affect them outside of the world of sport. Um, so for example uh, conversations that we had women um, often brought up uh, experiences of racism and discrimination that they had on the street or in an education system or in employment and and for a lot of women it was a feeling of solidarity when they heard stories that they could relate to um, and also a sense of relief where they could talk about it and feel like they were they were understood um, but what was the most um, impactful from my experience and from talking to the women of in the program was that Sport Against Racism Ireland was actually doing something about what they were talking about. So for example, um, previous clubs, they uh, Muslim women weren't allowed to wear their headscarf. So when we went um, and turned the um, program into an actual football club, which is now called Diverse City FC, um, it there was a lot of consideration that went into the design of the kit. Um, as was previously mentioned, um, particular groups are not one homogeneous group. There's loads of different um, uh, consideration or loads of different intersectionalities to consider and complexities to an individual group. Um, Muslim women can often be um, put into a homogeneous group and seen as having a common issue. Um, so for uh, the kit, what we did was trying to try to consider various levels of um, modesty. Um, so when we were designing the kit, what that meant was there was various versions of our football gear. So um, some girls chose to wear leggings under their shorts. We offered women the opportunity to wear tracksuit if they, they wanted to. Women could wear whatever form of hijab that they wanted with their gear. There was loads of options that catered for various forms of modesty within the team. Another thing that we did was consider training times. Um, so this, this could be applied across the board, um, whether it be attending events or um, attending training. Um, a lack of attendance is often understood or um, looked at as a lack of interest, when oftentimes it, that isn't the case. So um, attending training sessions, um, what if some people weren't attending, what we did was we've reached out and asked, is everything okay? Um, uh, is, there, is there something that we could do to um, help you attend the training session? So what we discovered was um, a lot of the women couldn't attend the training session at, um, at night. So once it got dark, their family didn't like them going out after, um, after uh, the sun goes down um, for safety reasons and for various other reasons. Um, so what we did was in the winter, we changed our training time so that more women could attend the, the training session. Um, we would make it on the weekend during the day when it was daylight hours. Um, another thing we did was consider uh, the period of Ramadan where women were fasting and we wouldn't make the training session as intense um, or we would try to, to schedule it at a time where they were breaking their fast so that they weren't um, uh, they they were able to continue to participate in in the um, 
in, in the programme. Um, we also considered language barriers. So a lot of the women that we were working with were coming from various different backgrounds and their level of English um, was at various uh, stages. So I think this can be applied across, across the board. And this is something that came up um, with the, the Special Olympics uh, as well, is the importance of demonstration um, and communication when you're putting across instructions. Um, so in our training sessions, we made sure to demonstrate activities and we stopped and asked people that, um, whether they understood the instructions before we continued with the, the activities. And over time, um, what happened, not just in, our, in the hijabs and hat-tricks program, but in our various programs, um, was that people were learning um, the language without feeling like they were being excluded because of their level of English and they could participate regardless of um, their, their level of the language um, and uh, yeah this that can be applied I think in, in various different spaces. Um, another thing we considered was prayer prayer time um, so we would we would try to avoid scheduling our training session at a time where women um, that were attending the training would need to pray or if it was a unavoidable we would provide a space where they could feel like they um they they could pray in a closed environment without um feeling like it was uncomfortable um to to pray out in out in public um so uh throughout this the the development of this program the hijabs and hatricks program what we did was we um, made sure to include these women in the planning of the program and at various stages reflect on our practices um and ask the, the women, whether um, there was anything that we could do to continue to make our team more inclusive. Um, and I think the main learning um, from this program was not to assume the needs of the people um, that are participating in this program, but actually ask them what are their needs. Um, and this, this is something that I implement even in my work uh, within Glen Cree um, Women's Leadership Programme, when we're working with women's groups, um, rather than just organizing events for the sake of it and hoping that people will be interested um, and find it beneficial, we actually talk to the women that we're, we're working with and ask, what are um, your, your needs? What are some of the skills that you'd like to improve on at the moment? What are something, um, some things that you feel uh, you need to upskill on to be able to do the work that you do? Um, and that was the same uh, with our, our um, work within Sport Against Racism Ireland. Um, to make sure that you're including the people's voices in, in the planning process and continue to do that. So not just have it at the beginning of um, the program, but in the implementation of the program um, so that those individuals um, feel included um, and heard. Uh, I'll leave, I'll leave it there because I could talk about this for ages. Um, but yeah, thanks. That, that, wow, that, that was amazing. I mean, I thank you so, so much. I learned so much. I was struggling to keep up with the notes and um, the commentary in the chat. Um, but, you know, can I just say how envious I am of the great work you guys are doing over in Sari? Um, I remember when I was a teenager, um, you know, integration was, was part of the education curve and um, I took up GAA, I took up hurling, um, you know, trying to fit in uh, uh, as a black um, Nigerian boy growing up in a uh, in Ireland. Um, it wasn't until one experience in particular, and I remember because, you know, I, I love sports. I, I used to play basketball, rugby, uh, soccer, um, GAA, as I said. It wasn't until a, a awful experience um, when, um, you know, I, I, I was going to score a goal. That's probably not the terminology, <laughs> but I was going to score. And uh, <laughs> um, one of my opponents got a, uh, not even my opponent, he was on my team, got the, the Harley stick and whacked it on my knee and started using derogatory terms. And ever since then, I never played again. But the reason I'm telling that story is because one thing you said was that somebody didn't show up to train and but you reached out to them and you asked them, hey, what, what was wrong? And, you know, a, a question came up in the chat, you know, what can, yes, section 42 doesn't have any mechanisms in terms of accountability, so what can we do? 
simple steps like that and um, ensuring that there are no barriers, ensuring that people are included. Oftentimes, uh, um, <laughs> again, I have to keep using my students as an example because I'm a lecturer, that's why I do. When students are in group work, they say, oh, one person doesn't say anything in the group meeting. Well, have you asked him why? Is he comfortable? Is he in a safe environment where he feels inclus uh, included, where his um, attendance at that place or space is not only welcome, but he's valued there. And that's what we mean by inclusion, not just to be welcomed somewhere because we can all get uh, you know, an invitation. I mean, I suppose that's the first part, <laughs> uh, you know, is getting an invitation to a dance. But when you get to that dance, is dancing like nobody's watching. That's what inclusive means and being allowed to dance like nobody's watching, to be yourself. So I love all that, that you just told us, and, um, you know, the bonding exercises, sports being used as a political too. And I totally agree with that because as, again, as I say, um, sports was something for me growing up was supposed to be an int integrative tool um, uh, until, I don't know if some of you watched um, my, tummy, uh, my part in Tommy Tiernan and I explained, you know, the difficulties when we, you know, use sports as a segregating tool uh, as an alternative, in the alternative. And I think the works that you guys are doing is just brilliant in trying to breach that gap and try to reach out to more people because sports is for everybody. And so if people aren't, uh, if a particular group of people aren't showing up to a particular sports, especially when the sports is the cultural sports of the country, we ought to ask questions. Why aren't they showing up? And so brilliant, I mean, I, I absolutely love that. And because we've been talking for uh, almost an hour now, why don't we take a little break? We have a poem um, by Daniel Kamenyezi, who's originally from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's a student in sixth year of uh, doing his leaving cert this year, and he's very interested in writing poems and writing music. So not too dissimilar from when I was Daniel's age, I used to write poetry and music as well. So uh, I believe he recorded a video um, if we have the opportunity to play that now, that would be great. Thank you. How equal are we? The first time we open our eyes to see the light is as the beginning of a new path of challenges to reach success, where a small warrior starts crying out loud at once in order to get attention from the beloved ones who whisper lovely words in his ears to calm his matters. We all deserve the rights to life regardless of our social status. Yes, we believe in equality, but how equal are we if voices of innocent people are not allowed to be heard? How equal are we if speaking the truth against powerful people is treated as a crime? How equal are we if sometimes qualified for a job but disqualified by the color of our skin? sometimes qualified for a job, but disqualified by our gender or background. We could not write these lovely words without education. So how are we equal if we don't get the same opportunity? We believe in love. Why not marry someone we agree with and make family regardless of background or religion? If we have a better place to live in, why not to say, welcome to those who seek Islam? We believe in equality, but struggle to bridge the gap of inequality. I believe we have our hearts in the right place, and change will be made up of small moments. Change happens when we have been hurt, but choose not to act from our hurt. We wish for a better world, but not at the cost of comfort and convenience. Wow, <laughs> that was so moving. Um, brilliant, brilliant poem. Um, is it clicking fingers that we do for poetry or we would do the clap in the hands? Um, totally resonated with that. And again, you know, um, the idea of equality if you go back to my, uh, uh, my analogy that I used, you know, um, my dad was a refugee when he came here over a very long time ago, and I've been here for 22 years, so son of a, a refugee, I totally understand, uh, I resonate with that poem, um, because growing up, uh, you know, like many of us in a predominantly white society, we don't see color, we treat everybody as the same, we, we want to be neutral, we don't want to talk about issues such as racism, 
um, but really I think what that poem really speaks to us about is that we actually need, when we talk about equality, we have to be able to be uh, able to speak about uh, the discomfort, um, the, the challenge and conversations. Um, you know, I know people, uh, I think Lola said at, at the start earlier on about um, we don't like the R word, we don't like to use the word racism, but it's a part of us. Uh, you know, we can't forego it because it is part of our experiences. And so if we try to hide it or deny it or tiptoe around it, maybe use harassment or bullying instead of racism, well, then what we're saying is that we're trying to hide those issues and we're trying to hide the, the real feelings and experiences of um, vulnerable and uh, disadvantaged members of society. And I think that what that poem tells us that we, although you know, we have equality in our hearts and it's, uh, you know, the sentiment is great, uh, we really have to live it uh, through practice through the application of section 42, for example, in our workspaces and our public services. So that is brilliant. Um, so I got some great commentary uh, from that. Um, we do have another poem, but we'll play that at the end. Uh, so why don't we, for uh, a few minutes or so, um, if we have any questions, now is a great time to uh, start writing them down. I should have said this while we're uh, listening to the poem. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to type them down in the chat box. We do have one question, and I kind of alluded to it earlier. Um, it's a question from Dr. Akeem Badmus. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Um, it's a question addressed to you, Lola, if uh, you're comfortable an uh, answering this. Um, so you've ex alluded to the defects of Section 42 we're talking about in terms of enforcement and accountability. And Dr. Akeem asks us, what can we the Irish mainstream and minority communities do to redress these inherent deficiencies? I don't know if you have any suggestions for us, Lola. Or Lola. You're still on mute if you want to unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Asher, and thank you for the question, Dr. Badmos. Um, I think I probably alluded to one or two things initially, uh, maybe not, um, but like I said before, you know, deprived and marginalized communities need more than just talking the talk. And, you know, the government needs to back the talk up by walking the walk. And um, I think first of all, that the hiring practices of um, public bodies, it needs to reflect a new, and changing, you know, landscape, you know, culturally, multicultural landscape. Um, when you, I mean, I know, I know you, we all, um, if you're a person who is considered a minority, I think you already understand the, this feeling of walking into a place and not seeing anybody that looks like you, because already you're apprehensive when you're walking into the place. It always like makes a lot of difference just to see someone, just one person that, kind of looks like you that might get you you know so that is very important and um, i also think that the public bodies must um make it easy for people and service users to complain to make complaints without fear of punishment and they need to it needs to be done also which by using the public body duty you know and I think this is great. It's not to punish anyone. It's about accountability. It's about um, self audit. Because if we make complaints and make it formal, or whatever, the public bodies know where to, what things to do, the adjustments to make. Maybe they need to train their staff. Maybe they need to listen more. Uh, then there needs to be an assessment, basically, like, you know, just um, taking into consideration what people are talking about, the complaints from people. It might be the disabled community, it might be black or brown people, it might be single parents, it might be like just it's it's a good feedback to be able to make complaints directly and using the, you know, using the tools that section 42, you know, as prescribed, you know, and also like I said, like there must be it's not, it's not enough for legislators to just make laws. There must be some kind of enforcement mechanism. And um, in terms of um, 
what we as a community community can do we need to organize we need to mobilize we need to talk more and um, we need to come together we need to be serious as well because you know you want to be taken seriously and you need to act seriously as well because it's lives of our kids you know our, our stake our quality of life is affected if we are not um, if we're being discriminated against then we are not enjoying like full citizenship you know and it's no good to anyone because um we the government spends so much money like enacting this uh, legislations and everything and not enough to back it up so it's a waste of money waste of resources human and um, financial resources so like there's no point trying to do all these things when you don't plan to follow through with them so it's like just wasting everybody's time and nobody benefits from this you know this waste of time so i uh, um, so far you know that's all i can say now thank you thank you that was uh, brilliantly answered uh, hopefully that uh, kind of answers uh, dr um, akim's question in terms of um I, I love what you say you know about visual representation that automatically uh, when you see somebody who has not even looks like you but uh, certainly um shares similar experiences as you mm -hmm. um can really make you feel safe and comfortable in that environment because then at least you're not yeah. going through that anxiety that awareness mm -hmm. you're not going through it alone so it's kind of a shared experience because if you think about it mm -hmm. everybody else in the room has that support um except for that one mm -hmm. visibly different person so why should that person be treated mm -hmm. differently when we should be looking at this equality framework so i absolutely love that and uh if i'm to steal uh <laughs> one of that um the hashtags that have been used is you know um just have one have one you know um ethnic minority person in your group and when you have one have another employ another and that's the best way to advance change in society so i love that um, a question is coming to me directly, so maybe it's intended to be anonymous. It's for you, Selena, if you don't uh, mind answering. We're asked what the composition of the working group you mentioned that is aimed uh, to implement in your PSD plan. Um, what is their composition, if, if you're at liberty to, to disclose that? Sure. Um, the working group is an internal one. So it's from um, functional departments. So, for example, there is um, two representatives from our land use and planning department. There's some from our housing department and also from community and social inclusion. And as myself is involved as equality officer and access officer, and then we have also a senior staff member from our corporate services department. And I'm within um, what we call our corporate performance and change management department. So that covers both corporate and HR. So uh, you know, I would be there with that kind of background as well. So that's just the internal working group. But we're also at a stage now where we are meeting with a small grouping from civil society. Um, we've tried to make sure that it is as representative as possible from the 10 grounds. And we're um, seeking their comment on a draft that we have put together from the work of the working group. So we are linking in with civil society within the county. Um, it's a very small group. It's not a, a consultation process. It's a very, very um, small, but also representative of, you know, uh, the ten grounds and being recognising the fact that of the intersectionality. So there would be there would be people out there who would be able to bring lived experience from a number of the grounds. So that's kind of where we're at, at the moment. So there is that kind of two sides to what we're doing and where we're at at the moment. But all that, of course, then would be bolstered by the wider work that we do with, with the various committees and structures and policies and working groups and all that's brought in into the process as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering that question. Um, and it's a, it's a very important question. And that's a question you should all be asking yourself wherever you work or whenever you're so, your social setting. What is the composition mm -hmm. of this decision-making body? Um, and uh, I think, sorry, just to put you there. Yes. I think it also raises a very important issue and something I, I, I mention a lot wherever I am. Uh, there's, I think there's two stages to equality. You've got a duty of quality action. So for example, set up, uh, you know, like the, the grouping that you're on with, with the department, mm -hmm. but then you need to equality proof that action. So when you look at that grouping, you need to ask, well, have we recognized intersectionality here? 
you know, are there, you know, women, are there disabled people, are there people from LGBT? You know, you, you have to, I always feel that there's, you got to do the equality action, then you need to equality proof what you've done before you can really have a true grouping to yeah. create change. Absolutely, absolutely. So you assess, address, and you report for what you've done. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, absolutely, that's brilliant. Again, we need to have the importance of representation or uh, decision-making bodies so that decisions that we make don't have adverse effect on the bodies that weren't in that decision-making process. Nothing without us, uh, nothing about us without us, as they say. So brilliant question. Uh, I have one more question, I think. Oh, I have a number of questions. This is great. So keep them coming. Yeah. Ken says, participation in sport for women is a basic human right, right on. Why has the government of the Irish Republic continued to fund sport bodies who refuse to insert equity and equality clauses in their constitutions? And that's a great question. And again, would, one would argue would be in breach of the Section 42 uh, uh, public uh, sector duty if they don't have that inclusion. So I don't know who the question is addressed to, but if anyone would like to pick up on that question in terms of, but why is it not, uh, why aren't we funding these bodies or why aren't we attaching um, as part of the funding applications, this requirement for equity or equality within their constitutions or their policies. Anyone would like to take that question from Ken? Selena, I see your hand up there. That's great if you want to jump in. Again, this plays into something I'm saying a lot over the last while, that when it comes to government, whether it's development of legislation or administration of grants and funding, we need to be attaching conditionality in relation to equality and human rights. Money should not be allocated unless we can be guaranteed that equality and human rights is attached, conditionality is attached. And it's something I'm saying widely in my day job and outside everywhere. Anyone who listen, if you're giving money or developing, you need to consider equality and human rights and attach to conditionality. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Anybody else? Amina. Uh I, I would just add that um, we need to hold um, politicians uh, or funding bodies accountable um, for, for their actions. So if it is the case that um, sports organizations or institutions aren't, um, aren't considering um, intersectionality in, in their um, approach to um, I don't know, like re recruitment or in their programs, they're not considering um, a strat including strategies to promote um, inclusion of of all. Um, then we need to um, call them out on call them out on it um, and say why why they haven't um, been been uh, implementing these um, policies or um, in implementing inclusive strategies. Um, something that I would um, call attention to is like um, Sport Sport England did a report um, called Sport for All. I think it was released in 2019 that looked at sport participation patterns observed for different ethnic groups. Um, and it showed that social inequality can, can contribute to um, participation patterns and um, reinforce stereotypes. Um, uh, and nothing like that has actually been considered in, in the Irish government. Um, like there is no research looking at, um, for example, the Irish Sport Monitor looks at um, uh, participation patterns in um, Irish sport, but nothing looks at how many mi um, migrants or people from ethnic minority backgrounds are participating in, in sport, what we're doing um, to address barriers to their participation. Absolutely, that's great. Thank you so much. Ken, did you want to say something? Go on, go ahead. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I want to say a lot by share, but I, I, I won't uh, hold you up yet. Um, don't forget, that. only what, about four or five years ago, uh, Port Marnock Golf Club actually went to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. to stop women for, from participating in, in their golf club. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. And then they, they came up with a compromise that women could play, but only in the winter on a Tuesday morning from 9 to 11 o'clock. So that you know, there's even the, even if the legislation is there, the barriers are still put up, you know, locally. And I think that's something that we have to tackle. And I mean, is right. It, it has to be tackled by the politicians, both on in the councils, in the local sports partnerships, and the TDs at, at national level. So it's a 
something like you know hijabs and hat tricks um is a very powerful body not just a a, a sporting body but a lobby body as well you know because it was hijabs and hat tricks actually established prior to the lifting of the fifa ban in uh, in 2014 so uh the, it was interesting that the um the football association of ireland actually actively policed the ban and and banned um young uh Karpreet singh a young sikh for because he wore a um a turban at a football game and he was out of football for a year you know the same thing applied to the women like uh, Amina mentioned Fadil Haji. Again, she wasn't allowed playing a football team. Absolute nonsense and a violation of him or, or for human rights. And this is what I, I argued. It was interesting. I, I had a meeting in Paris that I chaired, where um, where women from London brought a case against the UEFA, which is the European body of football, and they they uh, basically I chaired a meeting and William Galliard, who was the who was the assistant boss at the time to Platini? I uh, was at the meeting, and uh, I claimed that, uh, that that I knew he was educated by the Jesuits, and Jesuits, you know, was is really interesting. It's a typical Jesuitical response to the use of uh, male contraception. It was used as a prophylactic against uh, the spread of the disease. It's okay, but as a contraception, it's not okay. So I said, if the women were were wearing the hijab to keep their hair in place, would that be okay for them to play? And he, he understood that straight away. So he said, yeah, absolutely. So there was a, the UEFA, well, the UEFA had, had supported the uh, wearing wearing the hijab and other head covering. The FIFA were, were against it, the world body were against it. And there was powerful lobbies there competing all the time, you know? So yeah. it's really interesting. So when, sorry, when we created this uh, hijabs and hat-tricks uh, idea, uh, we, when it was formed for us, we won the, it was a first year operation. Uh, they won the, um, the Beyond Sport Award, which is a huge achievement. So that brought it into the international uh, arena, but absolutely no recognition whatsoever from this country. Sport Ireland, for example, in the women's uh, section, never mentioned hijabs and hat-tricks, despite the fact that uh, She Kicks magazine had the, the photograph of the team on the front page of their magazine which gave us international exposure. But here was a really hard sell and it and still remains that way until we change this legislation. Thanks. Okay. Absolutely. Great contribution, Ken. Absolutely. There's so much still to be done. Um, and, you know, it's conversations like these uh, that really empower us and strengthen us to, you know, want to be that change that we want to see in society. So it's great. And again, thanks everybody for being here to engage in this discussion with us. When Ellie finished, folks, well, I think I'll take one more question from Karen. Because I think it is important, uh, because we've been talking about um, effectiveness and accountability, we know we don't have that from Section 42 um, specifically, um, but there is an onus on us as individuals in civil society to ensure that, you know, the principles that um, Section 42 aspires to is uphold, upheld by our public bodies, uh, and the primary way to do that is through our NGOs. So Karen asks, does anybody on the panel think that the nature of NGOs that re represent disadvantaged communities essentially keeps those communities in silos. The NGOs are competing for funding and relevance. Is there an extent to which minor communities, minority communities, can't speak in a collective voice because of how they are represented by official bodies, that is NGOs? So basically I think we're talking about the compensation of um, the NGOs and who runs them, I think. and. Perhaps uh, I think the inference is that is that a disadvantage to um, the communities themselves? Um, Lola, I see you. Have, do you want to come in there? Okay, yeah, I could quickly say something, and maybe someone else has something else to say. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is that you see, allies and interest groups are very important, mm -hmm. very very important. I always say that when Martin Luther King and like the likes of um, John Lewis marched on Selma, you know, they didn't do that alone. They had white people mm -hmm. to, you know, went before them, went by their side, were being beaten as well alongside, you know, with them. So this, we are, we are all very important within each other's stories. However, allies also need to maybe step back sometimes 
and let the people who wear the shoes, the tight shoes, tell you where the shoe, the, their feet hurt. Basically, it's a saying, it's a proverb where it comes from that, you know, I'm the one who knows where it pinches my feet. Let me talk. You know what I mean? So in as much as it's very important for us to all, you know, be together. I mean, we're all here together, you know, in different colors and all that. And that's the beauty of, you know, what we're trying to do. However, it can hurt communities of um, disadvantaged communities when they are not allowed to tell their own stories and kind of basically be the captain of their ship. So, yeah. Um, so I, I just think that we we just need, we all need to kind of respect each other's um, boundaries in a bit and maybe listen more to 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 minority organizations and communities about how they think they need help rather than prescribing how we want to go about it, basically. So I don't know if that makes any sense. It makes yeah. all the sense in the world that I explained really brilliantly. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to, it, I'm reminded of the time NFET, uh, Nefesh, when they were thinking about the restrictions um, a couple of months ago, it was an all male panel and they were making restriction guidelines about hospitals, which mm -hmm. were affecting pregnant women. And so I'm always reminded that if they had women on the panel, they wouldn't have to, <laughs> they wouldn't have the issues and the complaints thereafter. And so nothing about us without us that, and you know, uh, I've taken many leadership courses and the greatest lesson I've learned from those courses is that the great leader, the best allies are the ones who are willing and able to give up their position to allow somebody who's well adapted and well equipped to take that position. And bearing in mind these principles of equity we've been talking about, it's about creating opportunities for less disadvantaged people. And the way to do that is by ensuring that those disadvantaged voices are at the forefront. So it's not using their voices as data collection or as you know, anecdotal evidence. Rather, it should be about raising their voice because they do have a voice. It might not be the same as yours or as eloquent as yours or in the same manner or language, but they do have a voice. And if we were to take that approach, the best interest of the child, for example, you know, everyone has a voice and they should be able to use it. And where they are able to use it, we should be willing and able to give up uh, uh, our seat for the betterment of somebody else who can do that, especially if it's in an area which affects them. And I think that was a great answer, Lola, in answering that uh, really clearly. Guys, we're running out of time, I'm, I'm afraid, Ken. Um, I see your hand up going up there, but I'm gonna have to uh, call it an end. Uh, before I do, um, there's another poem I would like to share with you, this time by um, Didier uh, Nga Boyeka. Didier, just by way of background, uh, is also Congolese. He's a poet. He script write, uh, he's a scriptwriter in Dublin. Um, he's also a presenter, or sorry, the president of Radio France International Club. Yes, so we have our audio recording of Didier reading his poem in French, and I'm going to put the English translation into the chat, along with a file that might help afterwards. Thank you so much, that's brilliant. En droit, tous les humains naissent libres et égaux. Tel un hymne, cette phrase résonne et fait écho. C'était un progrès social. C'est grec crucial le vital de faire un hymne à l'humanité en toute perspicacité. Cet hymne est confectionne et prend les droits humains qu'on nord et pèle une belle patronne sur un trône. Du nord au sud, la référence devenait les droits humains. C'était l'essence de l'homme. Désormais, les concerts de nos libertés individuelles servaient d'elle à notre propre envol. Le minorité. Parlons de minorité. Toutes les minorités avaient désormais une protection, une acceptation pour la consolidation de la civilisation humaine. Et toutes les nations mettaient en application sans hésitation la législation de la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'homme. C'était une aspiration des nations à la perfection dans leur coopération avec l'Organisation des Nations Unies. Alors s'arbore sur l'individu une armure juridique qu'il revendique béatifique, tel un magnifique cantique. Les droits humains sont la définition du génie humain.
human rights. What did he say? My French isn't so great. Where's that script? <laughs> human rights are the definition of the human spirit. What a lovely way to finish a poem. And if we think about the idea of where human rights come from, what we're saying is that these are rights that belong to us, not prescribed anywhere. Yes, they're written and codified in the ECHR constitutions and so forth, but these are rights that are inherent to us by virtue of just being human. That the minute we are born, even before we are born, when we are in our, uh, uh, the belly, uh, the womb of, of our mothers, we have rights from that beginning, the right to life. And so these rights are human rights. They belong to each and every one of us by virtue of the blood running through our veins. And it is in light of that, I would like to thank you all for attending this uh, uh, discussion about Section 42 and you, and how we might all uh, benefit from implementing this within our own fields uh, or whenever we use a public uh, service. If we don't recognize, uh, or rather, if we are become aware that Section 42 isn't being applied in the service, we have a duty to assess that, to report them to the author uh, appropriate authorities, whether it be uh, the Irish Human Rights Commissioner or the Workplace Relations Commissioner, or maybe your county councils, or maybe your friends or your local NGOs. Either way, we do have laws that are here to protect us, be it our constitution, our 40 talks about equality, the human rights provisions. We do have an ample resource. A lot of them don't have teeth, but we all do. And we all have a voice and we can be the mechanisms to ensure that human rights is affected in our society. Thank you all so much to all our speakers, to our poets and artists, and to all of you for attending today. It's been a pleasure uh, to uh, facilitate or moderated this event. And with that, I've said all I've had to say. I'm one minute past my time, so I apologize for that. And I'll hand over to Nadesh uh, to conclude. Thank you so much, guys. All the best. Thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. Um, the, the plaudits are coming in about how well you have uh, handled uh, uh, moderating uh, the, the speakers and the discussion. And I think we have to thank everybody, yourself and all the speakers. Lola's had to leave us now, uh, Selena, Amina, um, and uh, you know, everybody who asked questions as well and who contributed and who commented. Uh, I think we've had the most amazing uh, discussion and the two pieces of poetry, I think, stopped us all in our tracks um, and really brought home the message in a, in a very real, very direct, emotional way uh, to our hearts, because I think we have to take equality and human rights into our hearts as well as into our heads. And you've given us a call to action, Bashir, that really all of us in all of our dealings with public bodies, uh, both in practice and in terms of policies, consultation processes, and just being at the service counter of some public body and observing not just what happens to us, but what is happening to other people around us, that we all have power there uh, to take those stories further and to incorporate our knowledge at which we have gained greatly today. I think uh, Selena has really given us a great perspective from the council's point of view, from somebody working within a council. Lola has analyzed it uh, from a legal and activist point of view. And Amina has brought us right down to earth in terms of, you know, that it's actually about you know, the time that you do things, it's about listening to people, uh, being curious as to why people can participate or can't participate. And when you see that people are excluded, then, you know, just asking why, asking them why, what is it? And Bashir has given us some very, very um, moving examples from his own life and from um, you know, things that he has seen as a professional as well and his interactions with his students. So I think we've had a fantastic um, event today and I really, really appreciate everybody's contributions. And I really want to thank Sinead again, because from a technical point of view and also from just the publicity and um, uh, liaising with all of you as speakers, Sinead has done a huge uh, amount of work. And again, my, my colleagues, Amina and Holly and other other people in Glen Cree who have helped us uh, with 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 getting this uh, together. So uh, and and particularly also social inclusion unit of South Dublin County Council, whose 
who, who by, by sending us um, a proposal form every summer, you know, actually put it in our heads to do an event. And this is our second year of doing an event in the festival. And we hope that we will continue cooperating uh, with, with you all uh, in, in the equality, disability, access and social inclusion uh, sections of South Dublin County Council and 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 reach out more into into that into your um, hinterland basically. So uh, so listen, thank you all for for attending today, and uh, thanks again to Bashir and to Lola, Selena, and Amina particularly, and for all of you as, as a wonderful audience. Thanks. <laughs>